All right, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I'm Dwayne Havorka. I'm the Agriculture Program Director at the Isaac Walton League of America. The league was charted, uh, chartered 99 years ago in 1922 by 54 fishermen who were distraught by the destruction of the wetlands and the pollution of the rivers that they fished in. They launched an organization and as hundreds of chapters spread around the country, the league became known as the defenders of our soil, air, woods, waters, and wildlife. From the very first days, the League has been involved in agricultural policy. And today our agriculture program is focused on promoting policies and programs that help America's farmers and ranchers restore the health of their soils. By the time we get to the end of this briefing, I think you'll better understand why we focus so much on soil health. We are recording this briefing, so you can come back and watch it again. We encourage you to share it with your colleagues. Um, and we should have time for questions at the end. So if you have questions as we go along, use that Q&A uh, tab down on the bottom of your screen and you can um, give us some questions and we'll take those up uh, when we're done. Uh, and so let me now uh, introduce our speakers. Um, first, a thanks to the Walton Family Foundation, which has provided financial support for this briefing. And um, let me introduce our two speakers. So uh, Dr. Jerry Hatfield was a director of the USDA National Laboratory for Agriculture and the Environment in Ames, Iowa, part of the USDA Agriculture Research Service. The lab is a transdisciplinary laboratory focused on integrating the fundamental principles in soil, water, and air into animal cropping and watershed systems that leads to improved environmental quality, sustainability, and enhanced agricultural system efficiency. Dr. Hatfield is a longtime researcher and speaker on soil health and our natural resources. And Rick Clark is a fifth generation farmer in Warren County, Indiana. Rick's family has lived on the farm since the 1880s. He's built the soil health principles that Jerry is gonna talk about into his operation. He's been honored by Land O'Lakes, Denone, the American Soybean Association, and Field to Markets, featured in a film called Farmer's Footprint, and also advises other farmers through his consulting business, Farm Green. Rick's going to talk about his adventures in soil health and the economic and other implications for farmers. So Jerry, why don't you take it away? All right. Uh, whoops, lost you there. There we go. Uh, get that on full screen. Thanks, Dwayne. And we are going to talk about uh, soil health and its value for agricultural production and food security. Uh, as we go through this, uh, we'll be talking, I'll be talking about principles uh, and everything, and, and Rick will be talking about how it actually gets applied on the farm and the value in, in terms of production. So uh, we'll just go through this, uh, and I put together an outline for you. We'll talk about the functions of soil, we'll talk about soil health, we'll talk about how we improve soil health, and then finally, in terms of the impact on agricultural production and food security. If you think about the functions of soil, and this is a diagram from the FAO, the Food and Ag Organization of the UN, but if you boil it down to agriculture, uh, functions of soil they provide support for plants. We want the plants to stand up so we can harvest them. Uh, we don't want our trees laying over, so that's an important function. It's a water reservoir. It's a nutrient reservoir, a nutrient source. Uh, it's a very strong role in terms of carbon cycling. And then it's, uh, it has a function in terms of decomposition of pesticides and antibiotics that are in that soil as well. So you got all these different functions that are going on. But if you think about soil health, it's really that change in those physical, chemical, biological properties that increase those soil functions, increasing water holding capacity, increasing nutrient cycling increasing that capacity of, of support as well. So it's think about soil health as a capacity of that system to function as a living e ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. You, you really begin to think about health in the same way we think about human health. Uh, how do we begin to improve our ability of all of this? Diet, farm, doctors will tell you to diet reduce the sodium in your diet, uh, exercise, all these other things that contribute to health. Well, you think about those same principles relative to health in terms of, uh, of soil health as well. 
And, and I think about it this way, you know, that really it's the cornerstone of production to uh, production, environmental quality, economic return. And, and we can see the value of soil health in these different physical attributes. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to this diagram later in, uh, that I put together called the soil aggregation climb. How do, we, how do we build soils up and what's it mean? But if you can go in and, and you, you hold that soil in your hand, uh, we can tell and, and we can see and smell soil health. And you see it in terms of a profile, in terms of dark, rich soil at the upper surface. And then you've got the uh, B and C horizons as they're built up as well. And so you can actually see soil health uh, in all of this. And you see these changes that are going on. So, but you know, it's, it's how it influences production and environmental quality, profitability is all of this. So we'll start, we'll, we'll take it down to start with. <laughs> and, and we'll talk a little bit about degradation because as we start looking at how we've degraded our soils, you think about poor land management uh, in all of this. And the first thing that changes when we begin to Im impose poor land management is that we degrade our aggregates. Those simple aggregates that build uh, sand, silt, and clay together, they're held together by organic matter, they're held together by biological activity. Once we degrade those aggregates, we see uh, compaction in that soil, we see crusting in that soil. Uh, once we do that, we see uh, intensive water and wind erosion because we can no longer infiltrate that water. And when we infiltrate or we erode that topsoil off, uh, we begin to reduce plant growth. Once we reduce plant growth, we begin to uh, reduce our soil biology because we're no longer feeding that. And then we influence yield. And all of a sudden we have reduced soil productivity. We wonder where it all went. Uh, and we see this all the time uh, with uh, yield monitor data across fields. Uh, we see low yielding parts of that field that are a result of degraded soils and all of this. And, and this can happen slowly over time. We wonder where it went uh, in all of this. But I, I pulled off the, uh, the information from the, the Sanborn plots and the Morrill plots. These are long-term plots that were put together in the late 1880s. Uh, and the beginning trajectory of that was what that soil organic carbon was when those plots were first established. Uh, and then they've been imposed with all sorts of rotations. A, a corn, oats, hay rotation, a continuous corn, now a corn soybean rotation, a lot of this, and continuous corn. Well, what you begin to see when you had these uh, intensive rotations is that percent of organic matter is lost. 60% of that organic matter uh, lost 70% in, in the continuous corn aspects of of both the Sanborn and Moore. So we've really changed our soils over time and we continue to do this. Uh, one of the things we see is that uh, in analysis across the Midwest is that we use very sophisticated instrumentation to look at the carbon balance going into a corn operation. And what we time, this is a uh, study in 2000, the Midwest losing a thousand acres at a stage. Uh, it's the these fields don't have residue removal. The other thing is that drain. So, you know, you Hey, Jerry, this is Dwayne. Your, uh, your audio is breaking up a little bit. That's why it somehow it got muted. Is that better? Yes. I got to find my back to the presentation here. Um, that better? OK. So this typical carbon balance, so we continue to lose that. So we're, we're degrading uh, the soils over time. Uh, this intensive tillage that we have reduces soil carbon in the upper surface, because that's where it's coming from. It leads to this instability of aggregates at the soil surface. So we have poor infiltration rates. It limits that efficiency of uh, 
the precipitation getting into the soil. Uh, we see a lot of erosion coming off of fields uh, that have degraded aggregates, uh, and then we erode this uh, soil off the landscape as well. So you see all these different pieces that are coming on. Uh, the other piece of this uh, in an analysis that we did to show the value of soils, uh, we took uh, long-term yield data uh, across Iowa, Kentucky, and Nebraska, and we related it back to an index that NRCS has in its database. It's called the National Crop Commodity Productivity Index. It goes from zero to one. Uh, zero is a parking lot. Uh, one is a really high quality soil. And if you look across that, you see the closed circles are from Kentucky. That They have lower quality soils uh, and lower average county yields. So you move into Iowa. Uh, there's a, a increase in yields, uh, and each one of those points I, uh, is really a representative of 40 years of data. Uh, so it's not just one year. And then you can ask what's different about Nebraska. Uh, and it, what's different about Nebraska is that we only selected counties that had uh, irrigated uh, soybean production in them. Uh, and so if you can control the weather and control it by irrigation, the quality of the soil doesn't have an impact. But if you're dependent upon rainfall, uh, it does have a tremendous impact because it's the ability to infiltrate, store water, and make it available back to that crop. And if you just look at the variation of the NCCPI across the Midwest, you can see that as we move from uh, Indiana, Iowa, uh, in Illinois, Iowa, and then moving across the, the Midwest is that there's a difference in soils uh, in all of this. And, but even we get within a field, you see even much of a difference as well. Why this becomes important is as we shift the, the corn soybean production area into North Dakota and South Dakota, and even parts of Minnesota, we're not moving into high quality soils. We're going to see a lot more variation unless we improve our, our soil health as well. The other piece of this is that um, IPCC in 2019 put out a report on uh, land degradation and this, and they were really concerned about all of this in terms of loss of productivity, value to humans. Uh, they came to these four conclusions that, that are important out there is because climate change exacerbates that rate and magnitude of our degradation, that erosion both from water and wind. Uh, we're contributing to it by how we're managing our soils as well. I think the other piece of this is that last bullet point is that we can avoid this and reduce it or reverse it by sustainable land management, uh, restoration rehabilitation practices that provide many of these co-benefits uh, and allow us to basically increase the resilience as well as to mitigate climate change. And there's a lot of interest, obviously, in carbon markets, uh, how all this is behaving. And so this is really uh, kind of a foundational piece to show the, the urgency of this, but also show you the value of it. So we'll talk about enhancing soil health. And if you look at these key characteristics that everybody talks about for increasing soil health, reducing tillage, uh, continuous cover on that ground, cover crops, crop diversity, putting livestock back in there, and bio-based fertilizers, uh, which is manures uh, and, and organic substances that we put back on. So these, these are the six factors that, that really kind of everybody agrees to. Uh, not everybody implements all of these, but each of these contribute uh, in, in a way to do this. But if you have to think about it from this perspective, because as we change the soil, it's really dependent upon how we put energy back into that soil. And this is the, and car, energy comes from carbon. And so you think about this, we've got the sun, we've got CO2 and, and water, uh, and we create simple sugars out of that. That's the photosynthetic process. And we move that photosynthetic process, that carbohydrate down through the stem and root exudates we feed that into the soil that feeds the microbes, and then we end up with this nutrient cycling and carbon cycling, all these different aspects that are going on. So what we're really about when we think about soil health is how do we capture carbon from the atmosphere, put it into that soil, and make useful products out of it 
that influence uh, what we do in terms of time. Also, if you look at this and why this becomes so important is if you look at all the things that change how we store carbon within the soil, the first one that shows up is microorganisms, how we're feeding that biology of the soil. And then we get into the texture of the soil. And then finally we get down to topography and parent material. So our whole change of soils really depends upon how we feed and how we manage that, those microorganisms as we go along. And now, so we'll come back to that diagram that I showed you before, is if we wanna change our soil and think about this as a ladder, uh, as we go up this ladder, the first rung on that ladder is biological activity. Uh, we have to begin to sustain and promote biological activity. And soil microbes want four things. They want food, they want water, they want air, and they want shelter. <laughs> The same four basic food needs that all of us have. We want to be fed. We want to have something to drink. We want to have air to breathe. And we don't like to be disturbed. <laughs> uh, and you think about all this from a soil biological perspective. Uh, you know, we need to be feeding them. We make sure that they have the water, uh, the temperature, or the air that they need, and, and limit their disturbance. And what we see is that as we begin to change biological activity, we have these first processes that I, that I call the invisible and dynamic processes. We begin to change organic matter turnover. Uh, we digest things very quickly within that soil. We see improved nutrient cycling, but then we see the visible outcomes. We see improved soil structure. Uh, we see improved aggregates at that surface. We see improved water availability because we can infiltrate water, we can store water and all of this. So it's a, it's a ladder uh, that we're beginning to climb up as well. And you just think about this from a carbon perspective uh, and how we look at this. And, and I just use this simple diagram is that if we have, think about the, the different cropping systems that are out there and that orange bar uh, represents say a, a typical corn soybean system, only grows for maybe 120, 130 days in the, in the summer, uh, is that we have limited time for input. We have losses due to tillage. Sometimes, and, and what we've seen in a lot of this is our losses equal or exceed the gains uh, in all of this. So we have a hard time changing organic matter with our typical systems. But if we take and begin just add a, a cover crop at the beginning and the end of that season, we've increased that time for input. Uh, and so we have, we positively influence the carbon balance. We positively influence the carbohydrates we put into that soil microbial systems. We change these soils very rapidly. In fact, what we've seen when we've changed that conventional corn soybean system to a no-till cover crop is that we doubled the microbial biomass within two years. Uh, that's a tremendous change in all of this. We see aggregate changes within the first year. So things happen rapidly within the soil. Uh, they're more rapid than, than what we think. Just to give you an idea of this, we talk about that cover of, of soil on there and those that uh, outside of that is that there's three advantages for soil water. First, that, that cover protects it, that soil against raindrop energy. So that cover is, is absorbing all the energy. So water slowly moves into that soil. We maintain our infiltration rates. The other piece of this is we reduce the soil water evaporation. Uh, so that soil is no longer exposed to the surface. So the plant can use that water for transpiration where, where this is where growth is coming from. The third piece that, that occurs in all of this is our plant roots are very near the surface. So we take advantage of small rainfall events. Uh, we don't have to have two inches of rain to, to replenish that upper profile. We, we see advantages of even a half inch of rainfall. So you see all these different things that are going on that are all interconnected uh, in terms of these dynamics. Just give you an example. This is a, uh, a change in a field that we've uh, been working on in Northern Iowa. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, in 1984, there was soil organic matter samples uh, taken, and then in uh, 1996 or 1992, 
Uh, it went to no-till beans and in, in 2002, it went to strip-till corn. Uh, this has just been the increase in organic matter over those fields uh, over time. Uh, so there's been a tremendous increase uh, in all of this. You see that purple bar went from three point, almost doubled the organic matter over that 25 year period. What's more interesting uh, in this is that we did a deep dive into the yield monitor data across 18 years. And we segregated by soils within that field. And what's important is that if you just look across the top uh, set of graphs there, uh, in 2004 and 2018, uh, is look at the shape of that red uh, line across there is we took all the low yielding parts of that soil out. Uh, so we, we took the skewness out of that and we, and we made that tighter around the mean. Uh, we see that across all the fields that we analyzed uh, soils within fields. And this, this wasn't just one field. This was 10 fields, six different soil types. I just show you these two. But when we begin to improve soil health, uh, we improve that yield stability. Uh, we, we improve the efficiency of that field. And we improve profitability for that producer as well. So we see all these different things going on. So here's the implications of increasing soil health. Uh, we see enhancing carbon production or crop production efficiency. Uh, we're more able to use that, those resources efficiently. We increase the soil carbon. Uh, and, and when we do, we increase the nutrient cycling. Uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but all the micronutrients are, are cycled. So we see a lot less uh, deficiencies in there. We increase the field uniformity. Uh, producers really are very interested in how that, that uniformity behaves. The other piece is that we've increased the weather resilience. We're no longer seeing those variations in yield uh, uh, among years and a lot. And then we increase the profitability for that producer as well. So there are a lot of implications that are all tied together. Uh, here's my contact information uh, as well. And, and we can... Uh, in this presentation, we can talk about questions, but feel free to reach out anytime for further questions uh, from that standpoint. So, Dwayne, I'll turn it back to you. I'll stop sharing. Uh, and I think we've got time for maybe a, some questions, or do you want to go to Rick and then we can ask questions as a whole? Let's go to Rick. And um, thanks so much, Jerry. And folks, if you have questions, please use that little button down, the Q&A button down on the bottom of the screen. And as you think about them, go ahead and plug in your questions and then we'll uh, answer those at the end. So thanks and uh, Rick, over to you. Thank you, uh, Graham. Absolutely honored to be part of this today. Thank you for your time. I know we're very, we're very busy and uh, it's just a, a pleasure to be here to talk with you today. And I'm, I'm honored to be behind Dr. Hatfield. Uh, he set me up very well. So thank you. Um, it's all about being a good steward to the land. That's the way we take the viewpoint here on the farm. Um, and we also realize that change is good. Uh, this is very difficult. Uh, it's extremely opposite of the way most folks have been taught how to farm. And uh, the first thing we have to have to say is that we're not here to offend the way anybody does anything. We're here to show them ways that could augment their current operation. Uh, most of my neighbors farm, farm two crops, corn and soybeans. We are up to seven now. Um, corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, uh, milo, yellow field peas, and cattle. And the plus one is um, uh, what I call regen, which uh, lets you put a, a cocktail, as you will, which would be a concoction of several species of cover crops put together. Those are called cocktails. And then you devote that acre to that soil health building process that Dr. Hatfield just described so, so very well in his presentation. Uh, we are currently at about 4,200 acres of certified organic. The rest of our farm will become organic. Um, now, I, I want to say something right here now, though, uh, this is not going to be for everyone. So if, if you folks in Congress are looking at uh, ways to implement uh, cover crops 
or or reduce tillage practices or you know just follow the six principles of building soil health that will take us a long way toward mitigating climate and and starting to save this planet so we don't have to go to the extremes that we're going but i just wanted to show you where we are quickly so you see where i'm coming from um we've no, used no starter fertilizer no fungicide no seed treatments no insecticides for seven years now. We've not applied any phosphorus, potassium, or ag lime in seven years. So the way we can do these things is exactly what Dr. Hatfield was talking about. By letting these cover crops go further into their maturity, they're cycling and recycling these nutrients that are, there's thousands of pounds of these nutrients below our feet. We just have to learn how to unlock them, wake up the microbes, get everyone in gear and, and get, get going at, at full efficiency. Now, in my opinion, of the six principles that Dr. Hatfield had on the previous presentation, the number one, in my opinion, is tillage. Tillage has to stop because what's happening here is these fungal communities are being developed. And then once you get them developed, tillage comes through and wipes them out and now they have to spend all of their time rebuilding their community just in time to be wiped out again. So what are they doing for you toward building soil health? Very little. But if we can minimize or eliminate tillage, then we can start to build these communities and really start to see these soil aggregates being formed, the water infiltration rates, we just had, uh, within the last two weeks, I had our state soil health specialist here uh, from the state of Indiana, uh, works with the USDA and RCS. They did several water infiltration tests. And right now on our farm, our average water infiltration rate is 20 inches an hour. That is unreal. So what that means in a nutshell is we can take a 20 inch rain event in an hour and zero, well, zero is a pretty strong word, very little of that water is gonna run off. It's going to be soaked in to the profile and stored for a later date. Uh, no nitrogen has been applied in two years. Everything here is done as naturally as possible. We are organic. And I also want to mention here that we're beyond organic because we're doing this with no tillage. I just preached how important I think it is to remove tillage. We're trying to figure this system out with the use of cover crops and zero tillage. So again, this is not for everybody, but what we're doing, you can sure follow me somewhere on this curve and, and participate in being starting to be a good steward and a conservationist toward toward soil health. Okay, this right here is probably the most powerful slide I've ever put together, and this feeds right into what Dr. Hatfield was talking about. What this is is stability, and standard deviation here is yield. So as you look back in time and you see the, that, let's look at that left chart first, the corn chart. That variability or that standard deviation is the is the swing of yield in any given field as we make a pass through it with the combine. So as you can see, we had upwards of 30 bushels uh, swing in yield going through the field. But once we implemented the soil health practices, no-till, cover crops, we took all of the noise out and we have become very stable. This is exactly what can happen to every other farm in the country or for that matter around the world if folks would consider making change. Now, it's also important to understand that these changes do not happen overnight. You are going to need to be into this system two, three, maybe four years before you really start to see the effects of what applying the six principles of soil health are gonna do for your farm. Then you can start to think about pulling away some of these inputs. So, you know, if you were to look at, at what we've discussed today as not only uh, ways to, to get this planet covered with cover crops and help uh, slow down the release of CO2, 
and, and, and help sequester CO2, it also is going to be required, in my opinion, that if you're going to enter into a carbon market, you're going to have to follow these six principles of soil health. That's all there is to it. And that is a way to measure, that's the metrics you're going to use to measure the involvement of these carbon markets. Because in my opinion, carbon is kind of difficult. Dr. Hatfield uh, can have his opinion as well, but mine is, I, as far as I know, there's not a, a metric that measures carbon accurately and repeatedly every single time the same way, no matter when you go out and measure. If we took a measurement of carbon today and then we had a, a rain event and you came back a month, later, a month later and did it again, you're going to get a different result. That's just the way it works. So we have to think about, in my opinion, ways that we can measure these metrics by a spade, a, a, a slump test, a slake, whatever it is you want to do. So again, this slide is very powerful because it shows what the cover crops and the no-till and, and applying the six principles have done for our stability. Okay, I just want to toss a slide in here. This is how we plant soybeans now. This is on, this is April 27th. And just to clarify where I'm at, I am located in West Central Indiana. I am right in line with Philadelphia to the east and the uh, Iowa-Missouri Missouri border is to my west. That kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. So what you're seeing there is we go out, we're letting this cereal rye grow, we're planting um, the soybeans at boot stage, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna roll crimp um, the, the cereal rye and the soybeans down all together. And then you're gonna see in the next slide that the soybeans are not harmed in any way, shape or form. So I told you we are no tillage. So this cover crop has to suppress our weeds, has to feed the crop, it recycles the nutrients. See the pollen flying off the side of the roller there? That's anthesis. So it's dropping pollen, it's fertilizing seeds, we're at maturity. Now you come back and this is the, that same soybean field. You can see the rye, some of the rye there uh, from the previous years is still there. We're, we are creating this mat or this mulch that's there now year after year. And now the roller crimper that, that is going to come by and it's going to roll the rye down and the beans down. And you're going to see that those beans are absolutely unharmed. Now, in my opinion, every soybean in the United States should be raised in this manner right here. Because at this point, we've totally eliminated burn down. Now look, there's the soybeans. They're perfectly fine. They're going to grow right through all that and it's going to be just fine. So now we've eliminated burn down. So we're starting to save uh, money on inputs. We're starting to be good stewards to the land because we're reducing, reducing the toxic the toxicity of those of that chemistry on the field. Now you're in a position where you scout your fields and you spot spray only if your fields need it. So now we have made a huge jump toward applying those six principles of soil health just by letting some cereal rye grow further into the growing season and now incorporating that into your farming system. Here's corn. Now, this is probably our favorite way to do corn. This is an established field of alfalfa. And we are coming into this field and we are no-tilling corn into this alfalfa. I love these drone videos. They just, they just show everything. And, and again, folks, I cannot stress how dangerous this is or how risky this is to do at the level that we are. You're just not gonna watch this video go home and start doing this tomorrow. We are asking a warm season grass, which is corn, to be planted no-tilled into an established perennial, which is alfalfa. It's almost suicide. But if you do this correctly, and then you come back with this, the roller crimper at V1, V2, so that corn is, is one to two inches tall, 
and we are rolling this, this alfalfa down. Now, we know this does not terminate the alfalfa, but what we're trying to accomplish, look at that, isn't that beautiful? What we're trying to accomplish here is we're laying everything flat so the corn can come up and get, get vision of the sky and the sun and take off. Corn does not like competition, and that's why this is, is very, very risky. It's not impossible to do, but this is, is the level that you need to be very um, proficient at what you're doing here to get to this point. So I just wanted to show a couple slides on how we, we do things on the farm. Now I'm gonna go through these quickly because we're getting short on time, but this is what I'm talking about when I say we need to let the cover crops go further into maturity. I'm gonna guess that most rye in the United States is terminated at 12 inches tall because people don't want it to get out of control. They're coming in on that first warm day of spring. They've got a tank load of some kind of chemistry and they're gonna, they're gonna burn it all over the ground. Okay, what I wanna look at here is two columns for today, I wanna to look at two columns for, for sure. The nitrogen column, which is the first one, and the 0060 column, which is potash. I've made the conversion here. So what, let me set this field up. This was a cornfield last fall. We came in with 100 pounds of cereal rye. We no-till drilled that 100 pounds of cereal rye in the fall, came out this spring, and now it's starting to grow, and this field is gonna be planted to soybeans, okay? And soybeans need the, the nutrient 0060 or potash, okay? Now, at 18 inches rye, which took four days in the spring, rye grows that quickly. Look at what the potash number went to. It went up to 213 pounds. Now, th folks, this is just the above material. So what we do, we go out in the field and we measure out a two foot by two foot square. We clip everything in that square and we send it to the lab. And then the lab sends back this information. So the reason why we do a two foot by two foot square is we know what percentage of an acre that is. So then we can do the math when the lab sends back their data. Now look at the nitrogen column. It's at 120 pounds now. So this is why you may hear people say you cannot plant corn into cereal rye. Well, you can, as long as you understand what's happening here. Cereal rye is a tremendous sequester of nutrients. I do not buy into the fact that there's an allelopathic effect. I buy into the fact that the cereal rye is sequestering most of the available nutrients, and that's why the corn struggles to get started. So if you're in a a system that still uses synthetic nitrogen, then you move that nitrogen forward and you help offset this, this nitrogen that's being sequestered. 28 inch rye. Look at where the 0060 is now. We're up to 281 pounds. I mean, these numbers are outrageous. The K2O is at 169 and, and the biomass now is up to 6,800 pounds. So this is about the amount of biomass that we're gonna to need to suppress weeds. So I came back two months after the termination. So we roll crimp this rye and came back two months later because I wanted to see how much was left in the at above ground material. And as you can see, if you do the math from 281 to 65, that's how much of the 0060 was released back into the profile. Now, is all that available for this cash crop? Probably not, but I'm gonna say at least half of it is, and that's way more than enough to raise a soybean crop. So this is how we get to the point of what I showed you at the beginning of this presentation, how we've not applied any potash for eight years now. Okay, same thing on, on Balanza clover. Now, Balanza clover is a legume and legumes fix the free nitrogen that we're breathing right now. I don't know, I think it's 76% of our atmosphere is nitrogen or something like that. So let's take advantage of that, for just like the sunlight. Jerry talked about the sun and the power of photosynthesis. The sun is the most powerful energy source we have and it's free. So let's take advantage of it. So here's what we're doing with clover. 
So now, again, I'm going to move quickly here. I'm going to stop right there for just a moment. Now look at these numbers. The first column again is nitrogen. So again, this cocktail would have been planted last fall. It, it needs to grow and get established. I feel like clover needs to get to third trifoliate and it can survive the winter then. So you got to give it enough time to get to the third trifoliate, which in my region would be around uh, September 20th to October the 10th, somewhere in that area. Now look what the nitrogen, again, folks, this is just above ground. Two foot by two foot square, clip it, send it to the lab. This is what we get back. There's way more underground that I don't even know how to account for yet. So we're just talking about the above ground. On June the 8th, we're up to 260 pounds of nitrogen that is in that above ground material. And look at the biomass, almost 13,000 pounds. Now we're talking about suppressing weeds now. And we're talking about feeding this corn all season long. But we have to be careful here because, okay, there's, there's, we came back on July 24th and took a dead sample and look at how much has been exhausted. So this is for real stuff, folks. This is real. But you have to let these cover crops go further into their maturity to get to these points. All right, now. This sample was taken on June the 8th, and look at the organic carbon that was in this sample. It's, it's 5,200 pounds per acre. That's almost three tons. And this is a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 20 to 1. So the lower that number, the lower the first number, the lower the carbon number is, the quicker the microbes are going to devour and eat this up and you won't have that residue there suppressing weeds. So let's back up to that slide I showed about cereal rye. When we were planting cereal rye, the carbon to nitrogen ratio was probably 60 to one at boot stage. When we were terminating it at anthesis, we were probably at 80 to one. That product is going to hang around longer and we have to be careful because we're starting to imbalance this cycling a little bit. We're so high on that carbon that it's going to affect the way that the microbes are doing their job. So all of this stuff has to be done in, in a balance, so, so, to, so to speak. I also call this the power of patience because you have to be patient in Indiana to not plant corn until June the 4th, okay? All right, now we're getting toward the end of my presentation here. Now this is where the rubber meets the road. So what I did, I went back and I looked at how much money we were spending, or no, this slide shows amounts we were consuming in 11 versus now, okay? Our diesel fuel in 11, we were purchasing almost over 30,000 gallons. In 21, we cut our fuel consumption by 48.5%. We've cut our horsepower from 3,350 horsepower down to 1,200. So that's the main reason why the fuel has come down. But the other reason is we're not out there making all those tillage passes and all those other unnecessary trips where we've got a trip to plant cover crop, we've got a trip to plant the cash crop, and then we have a trip to terminate, mechanically terminate that, that cover crop. Synthetic nitrogen is now zero. Uh, MAP, which is uh, 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 monoammonium phosphate, is zero. Potash, zero. Uh, lime is zero. And now chemistry we've gone to zero on. So now this slide here represents what does that mean in today's uh, numbers. So that same fuel savings is worth $58,000. Synthetic in $375,000. The MAP, uh, $201,000. Potash, $227,000. Lime, $97,000. Chemistry, almost $300,000. So a total savings on our farm right now of input reductions is $1,254,000. That is serious cash. And, and again, if you don't want to do what this crazy guy from Indiana is doing and taking everything away, 
then take half of it and put $600,000 in your pocket. So these are all things that we can do, but there's so much more to this, folks. I mean, we've got to, we've got to understand that we don't have enough teachers to teach everyone how to do this now. We don't have enough cover crops in inventory to cover all these acres. There's a lot of things we don't have answers to yet, but we've got to start somewhere. Now, my, my thought, my question for you folks to think about is, is what would be considered a success? And I would think in your current administration, you're almost one year in now on your current administration, you got three to go. And, you know, if he runs again and wins, then you got another four, but you got three to go right now. I would think success in the type of a program of what Dr. Hatfield and I were talking about of getting cover crops established would be that 15 to 20%. So let's just look at corn and soybeans. There's roughly 180 million acres of corn and soybeans grown in the United States, roughly. It's about 90 million of each one plus or minus. 20% of that would be 36 million acres. Think about that. If we could cover 36 million acres with cover crop, this would be a huge step toward getting the rest of the industry to follow suit. I thank you for your time. I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And please, um, please have any questions you may have, please. So thanks again. If you put your questions in the little Q&A tab down on the bottom, I'm glad to take those. Um, let me start off with one for you, Rick, because I know you've got some tremendous savings in operating costs that you shared with us. Right. There's also an investment that, that comes with that. And it's both in terms of the equipment that you purchased, it's in the cover crop seeds, and it's also in the in the expertise and the education to get smart on how to do this. So can you talk a little bit about that, about what those upfront investments are for yeah. farmers? Yeah, actually, Dwayne, um, when you get to the point to where you've gotten comfortable with this system and you're confident you can, um, what's the word I want, um, you know, wean yourself off of the tillage equipment, you start selling that equipment. So the rippers, the moldboard plows, the field cultivators, all that gets sold in that first three years. So now, now that, that money you're, you're getting from those sales are helping to finance those cover crops that you're talking about to, to get that cover crop going. So now if we would think back on one of my slides and let's just pick the, the Balanza Fixation Clover slide. That cocktail that we put out there is about 20 bucks. And if you would take that nitrogen savings, I think nitrogen right now, let's say is 80 cents a pound. And let's assume that we're gonna use a uh, hundred pound. We're, gonna, we're not gonna wait till that June 8th to plant. We're gonna plant in that May 30th range. And it was a hundred units of N that we had, had fixed with that legume. Well, hundred pounds of N at 80 cents is $80 an acre. That cocktail costs 20, we're $60 a head just on the nitrogen and now you got to put a value on calcium and sulfur and 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 phosphates and all the other things that are being being brought up so yes there are expenses with that with that cocktail package and that's one of those questions i always get asked who's paying for this how how are we going to grow these cover crops well you're going to get it paid for by all of the returns that you're getting back so um it's a win-win-win, but you've got to stay to the, you've got to keep your nose to the grindstone and you've got to keep moving forward with this because there are days, I'm going to tell you, there are days where you just, you just beat on your head and you say, man, what is happening here? Because it seems like everything's going in a different direction than you want it to, but just patience and, and stay with it and, and things almost always work out. Thanks. Jerry, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I think Rick covered that very, very well. Uh, 
you know, uh, Rick, there's a question in the Q and A that's really for you <laughs> in okay. terms of <laughs> of a lot of this. And I don't. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, what have been your challenges in accessing cover crop seed? Ah. And also, have you or other growers had challenges accessing equipment like the roller crimpers? Yeah, that's a, those are two great questions. Um, as of right now, no, we have not had any issues ac accessing cover crop seed. And believe it or not, um, we heard all summer, all spring and all summer, how the, the high plains were burning up. And that's where a lot of cereal rye comes from is the high plains. Right. But you see, everyone has gotten better at their job, and we have still been able to get all this, of the cereal rye that we need. So those folks out there are doing a tremendous job. Um, now, the roller crimper, that's a great point, because I think what needs to happen here, I think that the you've got the government already has your workforce in place, the USDA NRCS office is in place already across the country. So we need to think about equipping each DC's location with a roller crimper that can then go out to the community as either a free service or a very cheap service and get these folks used to looking at something like that. Or maybe you do one per two counties or something. But this is the type of stuff that people need because there's always that excuse out there. Well, I don't have a roller, so I can't do this. I don't know how to get one. Well, we have to take as many of these excuses away from the farmers that we can. So two great questions. And so far, we've been able to get everything that, that we need, including the, the crimpers. Good to hear. And I know we've seen examples of like soil and water conservation districts that purchased a roller crimper to lend out to farmers to get them some experience with the equipment. So this is, I think, for maybe, maybe for both of you. So what federal policy barriers prevent farmers from moving to this system? Yeah, I, I'm gonna go with that one first, Jerry. Um, I'll, let you, I'll let you go first. <laughs> uh, RMA. RMA is a big stumbling block here because the way the rules are written within RMA, I wouldn't even qualify for crop insurance because I'd be kicked out the way that we're farming. And just so you folks know, I've not taken any multiparal insurance now for three years. Uh, I no longer am in any government programs and I took zero CFAT payments last year in 2020, zero. That's how much I am relying on our system and what it has done for us. I am no longer wanting the government subsidy help. And I think we could all get there. And if now, if you think about that, think about what you could take with that money and wrap it into a policy that's really going to drive soil health across this nation. So, my first thought on that, my first answer is that RMA, those rules are going to have to be changed. Go ahead, Doc. Hey, and I'll, I'll just amplify that. The, the top two insurance claims across the Midwest are excessive moisture and drought. <laughs> and uh, if you look at that, that's 49% of our claims. And we can change both of those by improving soil health. You know, and, and it, it, you know, you go back to uh, the Rick's number on, on 20 inches of infiltration per hour. Typically across the Midwest right now, our average infiltration rate is about a half inch per hour. Uh, so you look at this and you get a one inch rain per hour. It means that we only get a half inch in and the other half runs off. I mean, it, you, and you see this all the time going on. And, and so I think our, I'll echo Rick's comment on RMA. Uh, I think our whole farm policy uh, is a detriment to uh, change in terms of this. Uh, and, and we really need farmers to become more innovative uh, in, in their whole practices and assured that they, they actually can improve their, their profitability. They can improve their satisfaction of farming. I've spent a lot of time on this lately that I, I think in a lot of producers, Rick is, is very satisfied with what he's doing, but I think there are a lot of other producers that farm, but don't really derive satisfaction from it. Uh, you know, and I think we need to address that as well. And I think our overall ag policy 
really needs to look at this. I think the other piece of the ag policy is that we need to start thinking about quality uh, of our produce, the protein, the, the starch content, the oil content. I really think that we need to start thinking about how do we reward producers for improving the quality of the product because that's really where food security is coming from. Yeah, nutrient density. Yeah, Nutrient density. Yeah. And well, I'll echo uh, that uh, the comment that Rick made in terms of his yield variation over time is that when we build resilience into these systems is that we're no longer seeing that variation among years uh, in a lot of this. And that is a large, major, major value to, to producers. Right. If you were to bring that stability in across the whole country, there would be no reason for multiparal crop insurance. Exactly. <laughs> so clearly there are some, some big wins, some big benefits for farmers from these soil health practices. Uh, there's some clear benefits for our natural resources from having farmers put these in place. So what's the best role for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in terms of outreach and education of farmers? Um, are they the right people? What do they need to be doing more of and, and who else ought to be involved there? Go ahead, Jerry. Well, yeah, I mean, that. Uh, I think USDA plays a major role in this. I think USDA needs to be much more aggressive in uh, promoting uh, changes in systems uh, and promoting this. I mean, I think we're, we're still stuck in, in this whole thing of conventional agriculture. Uh, I think that we can, uh, USDA needs to really show the value of, uh, of alternative systems. Uh, and I think the, the, it's promoting in terms of, uh, of cover crops. Uh, I've been very concerned about Rick's com comment in terms of cover crop seed. I think we're gonna have to figure out how to incentivize uh, cover crop co-ops <laughs> in terms of being able to produce the seed uh, for local regions and things like this. I, I think that all of this is that USDA needs to stand back and say, what do we want for our, our, our agricultural production system? How do we want for our soil resources as we go forward? That's why I threw that IPCC land degradation in there. I'm very concerned about the state of our soils and, and how we can preserve our production capacity as we go into the future. And I think we need to bring all those together in a very systematic way and not just look at it from one piece of the puzzle, but look at it as our overall agricultural system. Yeah, and I, I want to, I know we're running out of time, but I want to throw one more thing in here. You know, Dr. Hatfield and myself have pretty much only talked about soil health and the soil. The other thing we got to think about here is our drinking water. Yeah. We've got to maintain our purity of our water supplies. And we, we are not doing that in the prop current methodology that we're using farming. You know, Dr. Hatfield just mentioned that most soils have a half inch infiltration rate. So we get a one inch rain event, half inch is leaving the field, like he said, but it's also taking with it those harmful pesticides and, and, and acids and salts that are hitting our streams and our rivers. So there's so many layers to this. And then the last thing I would like to say is, you know, if you wanna to continue to, to give money to the farmer, that's fine in subsidies and in whatever method or whatever you wanna call it, but let's stop giving money away and getting nothing in return. How about set up a program of five levels? And if you want to maximize the payment we're going to pay you, you better be in, in, you know, putting to use all six soil health principles. If you only do one, you're only going to get 20% of the payment. I mean, that's the kind of teeth you've got to put into this to get these farmers to move. Jerry, any last words of wisdom from you? Yeah, we, well, I don't know if they're words of wisdom, Dwayne. <laughs> I guess I'd, I'd like to express my appreciation for those who've been listening to us and everything else. Uh, I, I do think we have some, uh, we have challenges, but I think we have a greater set of opportunities as we go forward. I think there are producers like Rick. Uh, Rick 
is is not just an island. He's one of a lot of people that are making these changes. They're understanding what we can do. Uh, we got a long way to go. Uh, and I think we need uh, to think about the overall aspect of the environment. I, I, I spent a lot of time on this whole aspect of agroecology. How does agriculture fit into the ecological system uh, that we have and, and all of this? And we, we talk about ecosystem services. Uh, you know, Rick mentioned the water quality, but we've also got other things in terms of that habitat. I think we need to take a much more holistic view of how agriculture fits in to our society and not only for food production, but for the environment, as well as all of the different pieces that it touches. So Dwayne, I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, those in the audience uh, and those that see this recording, uh, my contact information is there. You can look at, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're, we're very willing to help and, and uh, guide and, and provide information as, as needed. Right. I want to say the same thing. Thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here. I, I put my contact info up there. Please reach out if you have questions. Um, again, you, you've got a lot of work to do. We know that. We, we just are glad you're willing to have these conversations. So um, please keep pushing this forward and, and thank you so much. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate your being here. Thanks for the folks who tuned in. Uh, we are recording this, so we're gonna make this available to others and encourage you to share it with your colleagues. I'm gonna share my screen here just so we can get that uh, contact information back up on the screen uh, while we're closing out here. And there we are. So there's uh, emails for all three of us. Please feel free to reach out to any of us uh, on these issues and with questions that you have. And again, uh, thank you both, Dr. Hatfield. Thank you, Rick, both for all the things that you're doing, all the, all the great work that you've done, all the things that you're doing now, but also um, for your efforts to reach out and educate others about these really important, uh, really important issues. So thank you both. Have a great Thanks day. to everybody. And we will end it here.